Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Lauren Grush and I am the senior science reporter at The Verge specializing in all things space. And I'm very excited to host a really exciting panel today that we've called the Space Gold Rush. In 1849, James Marshall discovered gold at Sutter's Mill, sparking a surge of gold seekers in California and the rise of massive industries in rail and shipping. We might be on the verge of a repeat on that, but today, innovative entrepreneurs aren't looking to the West for the next gold rush, but to the sky. A host of voices in fields as diverse as finance to astrophysics have predicted that Earth's first trillionaires will be minted in space through asteroid mining, 3D printing, and satellite servicing. So when will the generation of 2049ers take to the stars, and how will the space race space rush change our world and our lives. And here to answer these questions, we have a great panel today. I'll introduce them for you all. First up, we have Joe Landon, the Vice President of Advanced Programs Development and Commercial Civil Space at Lockheed Martin. Next up, we have Alex McDonald, the Chief Economist and ISS National Lab Program Executive at NASA, and Daniel Suarez, author of Delta V, a novel that follows the world's first deep space mining expedition. Thank you all for joining me today. I'm really looking forward to having a great discussion about this. Let's start off with perhaps the most basic question when it comes to space mining and using space resources. Where did this idea come from? And why is this something that people wanna do, use resources from space? Alex, maybe you can start us off with this question. Yeah, sure. Well, thanks. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, pleasure to be here with everyone virtually. Um, you know, in some respects, the story actually goes back well over 100 years. Uh, people in the 19th century started writing stories about space mining. One of the very first ones was uh, a book called Edison's Conquest of Mars. It was a sequel uh, written to the War of the Worlds, where uh, the world strikes back at Mars. And on the way to going back to Mars, they pass a Martian asteroid mining camp. Uh, this is one of the first mentions, but in the early 1900s, one of the first landmark descriptions of asteroid mining came out from a Russian uh, space physicist and theorist, uh, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky. And he was thinking about how are we gonna create a space-faring civilization? And when he thought about it, he thought about it in a kind of classical way, which is that all civilizations have to mine basic resources from somewhere in order to create the products of civilization. So he thought if you have a space faring civilization that the place you're gonna probably mine some of your raw materials is from asteroids. And uh, so to speak, it's been off to the races ever since then. Uh, asteroid mining has been a regular staple of science fiction. And starting in the 18, uh, sorry, the 1980s and, and 1990s, now, how it might work in practice. And of course, it's, uh, you know, become a, a recent hot topic in, uh, in recent years as well. And I will say that uh, I've had the benefit of not being a century ago, I could actually talk to uh, entrepreneurs who are designing equipment to mine asteroids. So it's, uh, it's transitioning from fiction into fact. Yeah, and let's touch on that. So what are some of the technologies that are enabling us to make the idea of using space resources or in situ resources more of reality that, that we can actually do sometime in the near future? Well, I think the first one would be reusable rockets, the ability to get things into orbit more cheaply and more reliably. I think that's one of the biggest things. And once you're up in space, there are numerous companies, uh, I guess I won't name them here, uh, not to pick just uh, winners and losers, but there's numerous uh, startups that are designing uh, in-space manufacturing, 3D printing, all sorts of supporting uh, logistical technologies that will make this possible. And again, these come from Earth-based technologies that are moving up into space. And, and again, it's uh, you know, fast processing, cheap processing, all of these things, remote control. Uh, many of these technologies are going to make it possible. Telepresence in particular, I think a lot of people, when they think of asteroid mining, they think of people in spacesuits with a pick <laughs> swinging at a rock out in space. And that's not at all how it's going to happen. Uh, mining in space will be vastly different from mining on Earth. As a matter of fact, there's very little similarities. Uh, I always like to tell people, try to imagine uh, mining a, a pile of gravel that's in free fall in a radiated vacuum. 
uh, that's that's very different from digging a hole. Yeah, and if I could jump in, I, I agree with Daniel. I think you know my my former company uh, was Planetary Resources, so one of the the companies that was you know specifically focused on asteroid mining and developing these technologies, and you know we we uh, were even earlier than than some of the technologies that Daniel mentioned. So you know, we focused on how do you find uh, resources that are valuable in space and characterize them, right? We really use an analogy to the mining industry where, you know, before you can build a mine, you have to know where to build it, right? So, so the technologies for remote sensing and of course launch, you know, getting um, spacecraft into space is, is essential, but, you know, remote, remote sensing and ways to go out and, and identify where you want to, uh, you know, set up a mine later, so to speak. Uh, and then uh, just, just to foot stomp some of what Daniel said, autonomy and telerobotics will be key. Uh, because it's not going to be traditional sort of miners down uh, in a mine. And this actually, there is some parallel with the terrestrial mining industry where they're very interested in how to apply some of the technologies that were being developed for asteroid mining in terrestrial mines, you know, particularly the autonomy and telerobotics. And that's where the realism comes in because I was able to interview some entrepreneurs who are right now testing in real earth or terrestrial mines robots that would be then uh, put to use in lunar mining or asteroid mining. So there is some crossover. And by the way, I, I suppose we should start out by really emphasizing, uh, I believe, Joe, you two are also talking about near-Earth asteroids, at least initially. Right. Uh, we're not going to leapfrog past Mars to the asteroid belt. Uh, sure, there's an enormous amount of resources there. But one of the really key things about near-Earth asteroids, and of course, not all of them are, are, are known, but uh, for instance, the asteroid Ryugu, I believe, was discovered in just 1999. But to be able to detect and characterize all of the asteroids that in near-Earth orbit, and these at very particular points in their orbits can be really close uh, to Earth energy-wise. So from a delta-V point of view, that is the energy or the acceleration you would need to reach them, we could be less than the energy needed or the delta-V required to reach the surface of our moon, which is really an amazing thing because you wouldn't have to go into orbit around them. You could just kind of pull up next to them because they don't have a very deep gravity well, unlike, for instance, the moon, which has a, a shallower gravity well than Earth. But you know, with an asteroid, it's uh, retrieving the material might be significantly easier and returning it to cislunar space quite a bit easier as well. Right. That'd actually be a big difference from the from the original gold rush. You know, instead of having to climb into the mountains of Colorado or California, right. you can actually pick your target because the asteroids, we can see them now, right? The only thing between your eye and the asteroid is, is the roof, right? So you, we can actually characterize them quite well and pick the, the, the one and the target that is closest to where we need it. Yep. And, and again, you know, you look at these little keyholes that they have in their orbits, uh, you know, it'll be really high delta V for the longest time, but at a certain particular orbital window, that will plunge very low at times. I was going to say, rather than panning for gold, it's kind of right there in plain sight. Yeah. <laughs> you don't, you don't need to search yeah. very hard for it. Still hard to get to, but for different reasons. <laughs> yeah. Well, obviously, we 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 think a lot about gold when we think about the gold rush, and and dollar signs also come to mind when we think about space. But what what kind of business case is there for going out and finding these resources? Uh, Joe, maybe you can start us off, and maybe Alex, you can get onto that as well. I'm just curious, are we going to be using these materials in a traditional sense or, you know, how, how would they be become their own economy in, in their own way? Sure. So, uh, so I'll start. I think the business case for space re resources really centers around uh, finding resources in space to use in space. And that's an important distinction. Uh, it, it really doesn't make sense, at least today, to, to even think about bringing space resources back to Earth. It doesn't make sense. I think actually it's the same same reason, the same scenario that Daniel's you know, excellent book, Delta V, uh, set up, right? That, that's, that's what it's for. So, um, you know, and the reason that makes sense to, to think about space resources for space is because of gravity, right? So everything that's, that, that, has, that humans have put into space, it was built here on Earth and then launched into space at enormous cost. Uh, and that cost is because it takes a lot of energy to get from the surface of the earth up into space because of uh, uh, the gravity. So, you know, if, if instead of doing that, we can find resources in space uh, that don't have to pay that tax of, of uh, the gravity tax of getting off the earth, uh, then the economics of space, uh, everything in space change. So, you know, for example, if you had, uh, uh, could find fuel in space, then you wouldn't have to launch rockets full of fuel or a spacecraft wouldn't have to be full of fuel and pay to launch that fuel into space. You could launch them empty and fuel up once you get there. So that's why the, really the business model, the business case for space resources starts with uh, fuel, right? Which you could make from water. 
Uh, and then it, it goes into uh, materials like building materials, like metals or, or something you can use to build, build with. Uh, and then later, maybe some more exotic uh, materials or, or manufacturing uh, inputs to manufacturing processes. Yeah, and just to build off what Joe was saying, you know, I think those are some of the main cases. Uh, obviously, people talk about water a lot. Uh, water, of course, can be used by, by the astronauts, but it can also be made into rocket fuel. Um, people also talk about using the in-situ resources to develop basic structures. So people talk about uh, centering the lunar regolith in order to create robust landing paths. Um, as an economist, the challenge with all these things is that um, some of them uh, might have a cost savings, but many of them actually might be much more expensive. Uh, one of the challenges that we have noticed, for example, is that all the things that are very exciting, like reusable rocketry that make people excited about a future for humanity in space that is expanding and growing, actually make the business case for certain types of space resources um, worse uh, because the cost of the substitute good for in-space uh, manufactured fuel is simply terrestrially launched fuel. And as that launch cost goes down, uh, it might actually mean that you just launch your fuel, but maybe you use the regolith for a landing pad because uh, that is economically advantageous. I think right now we're so early that we don't exactly know which of these things is going to be the first best use case or even when they're going to be. But in the long arc of what we hope is going to be a long future in space, we know that at some point uh, we at least want a level of human activity in space that will justify and demand space resources. And that's why NASA continues to fund R&D in this area to try and bring that day, day close. Yeah, and I By think way, just, uh, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna, gonna um, build on what Alex said, you know, there are some, you know, we're making investments in some technologies that uh, can support that future, whether the fuel is launched from earth or in space. So things like the ability to store fuel in space and to transfer it from one fuel tank to another. So like either way, those types of investments are, are important and we can, we can work on that now. And NASA is, is, is doing that. I would add only that, uh climate change is going to add yet another variable into this mix. And, and that is the idea of launching hundreds or thousands of rockets high up into the atmosphere, particularly if they have any methane in them, uh, this steady cadence of loss, launch, again, we're going to want to launch rockets, but thousands and thousands upon them, uh, of them, that could really potentially do some interesting damage at high levels in the atmosphere. And again, if you can avoid that uh, by having in situ resource utilization, again, that could adjust not just the economic cost, but you know, the, uh, the uh, consequences to the environment and so on. I think that's a great point. And, and one of the things I studied this a while ago that we really don't also know what the consequences of launching all of those rockets will do right. to the environment either. And so we, to avoid that, it would be better if we can use what we can find up there in space already. Oh, uh, yes, exactly. Although Alex, you're not wrong, obviously. I mean, now, and I, I wonder as, as this experiment unfolds, uh, what we're gonna discover. All right, so let's focus on ASHRAE mining, which we've already talked a little bit about. This past decade, there was a bit of, a lot of buzz around asteroid mining with various companies like Planetary Resources, Deep Space Industries that popped up promising to utilize the resources that they find from these objects. Um, however, some of those companies have not uh, advanced very far and a, some of them have been purchased and bought and have had to go there on a, on a different direction. So I'd love to talk about what are some of the struggles that asteroid mining presents and how, why did that lead to say some of the, the, the not the success that we were hoping for, for this industry. Joe, maybe you can start. Sure, yeah, I'll jump in as a, a proud planetary resources yeah. uh, veteran. Uh, you know, unfortunately, I think these companies were a bit ahead of their time. Um, you know, the, the focus that we had was on water as a resource to use as fuel. Um, but, you know, in, in any type of commercial market, you need to have a product and a customer. And I think uh, really neither existed with enough maturity at the time. Um, the technology was advancing and it wasn't really a technology challenge, although there were technology challenges. Uh, you know, in order to, to raise capital and to you know, attract uh, people to your team and, and, and have a, a company, uh, you had to have someone, you had to have something to sell and someone to buy it. And neither of those really uh, were farther enough along. I think um, 
you know, it really it was really two leaps of faith that were required for asteroid mining. And still to this day, is, the first leap of faith is that you know a company or someone would be able to actually extract something useful. And then the second leap of faith is that there'd be someone there to buy it. So I think you know this is really why I'm I'm really excited about NASA's Artemis program. I don't want to skip ahead, but I think that we will get to there eventually, uh, we'll where there. <laughs> yeah, you know, and how how uh, NASA you know as uh, as a government you know can can step in and advance the technology and create some initial demand for resources really to support exploration at first. I think that was sort of the missing link. Yeah, yeah. Sort of being a lighthouse customer, you know, mm -hmm. making the market. Yeah, one thing that we've noticed uh, certainly is that there is a high degree of correlation between the type of space resources that companies look to pursue and where NASA has most recently um, been directed to go explore. Um, and uh, in 2013, uh, NASA's direction was uh, known as the NASA Asteroid uh, Retrieval and Utilization Mission. Uh, name changed over the years. It was the, uh, the R mission, the Asteroid Redirect Mission for a while, but that last name there of retrieval and utilization kind of represented the, the high watermark, I would say, about that particular idea uh, in, that, in that era, uh, that we would go out to an asteroid and that we would just begin the process of learning how to manipulate the raw materials there, extract it, figure out how you would do it. Different concepts were bandied about. Um, and consequently, uh, a number of companies at the time were formed to uh, go and develop um, types of technologies that would feed into that program. Uh, NASA was uh, redirected more recently to focus on the moon. And correspondingly, surprise, surprise, uh, there is now a lot more focus on companies developing technologies for lunar resource extraction. Uh, and that's simply because NASA remains to this day, uh, by far and away, the largest funder of all R&D and, and missions in this area. Um, rocketry is an incredibly important area and that is seeing a lot of private investment. Um, but things like space exploration and uh, probes to other worlds is still uh, very much predominantly a government affair. Although, of course, that may change in the future. You know, it does remind me of the voyages of sovereign exploration between 1400 and 1600 and something. You'd have these initial very expensive government uh, funded expeditions and quickly followed by commercial expeditions. You know, once it was proven, once the technology was tested out and the risk level goes down, and also there's some knowledge about what time period for return on investment, all of that very important information, uh, governments can help to illuminate. Yeah, and I'll say just quickly, that was exactly the thinking behind the uh, asteroid mission, which was that this was gonna be the first mission, NASA was gonna conduct it, but that it was going to lay the groundwork for future missions to come. And that general strategy is still uh, the way we think about it at the agency. I'm no matter still warning about that mission, by the way. I, I, I wish they did it. Well, well Daniel, Daniel, Alex, I mean, let's, let's, uh, this whole time, actually, there was a mission called Osiris Rex that was plugging right. along. And just this past year, you know, it was a robotic mission. Uh, it it uh, arrived at Bennu and took a really incredible sample oh, yeah. of that asteroid and soon will be, be heading back home. So I think that, uh, you know, is, is really great progress on space resources. I mean, it's, it's not asteroid mining per se, but it's pretty darn close. Yeah, and it's a great reminder that often it's the scientific exploration that precedes all of it, yeah. right? Uh, that our first encounter with these optics is usually um, from a perspective of just trying to learn what's there and trying to answer fundamental science questions. And then as that knowledge accumulates, we then start to think about, well, hey, what parts of this might be useful for future human activities? But yeah, our science mission directorate is, is actually always at the frontier of, uh, of, of our space exploration activities because the robotic probes uh, uh, can certainly travel much farther uh, and cheaper, um, you know, without uh, having to uh, take our, 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 our human selves along with them because our human selves are very expensive. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny, when I was uh, writing my last book, JAXA uh, sent out a, a mission to Ryuga, the Hayabusa 2 mission, and I was in this unusual position uh, writing sci-fi that was becoming true as I was writing it, in the sense cool. that we did not have detailed pictures of Ryugu when I started writing it. And then as I was writing it, we arrived there and I was basically seeing it for the first time along with everybody else. And it, it was a kind of a, a cool experience. It made it very real. And again, like you said, the, the scientific missions are sort of pulling back the curtain and letting everybody see what's possible. I want to jump in. Maybe Joe, you can answer this. Um, I've been at Lockheed Martin. One of the things I loved about the OSIRIS-REx mission is just how much of a surprise the asteroid was 
when the mission actually got there. And we tried as much as we could to study it from earth, but really it blew our socks off when we got there and the materials were different, just how rocky it was, was different. You know, how valuable was, is that going information going to be if we actually do want to send uh, missions to mine these types of asteroids in the future? Yeah, I mean, you described it really well. I mean, we had sort of a fuzzy picture of a circle of a sphere as our uh, initial idea of what Bennu looked like. And uh, as we got closer and closer, you know, the, that resolution was increased and we learned more about it. But you know, up until the point where the sampling had uh, touched the surface, we didn't know whether that surface was going to stay put and will bounce off of it. It turned out we actually went right into it. So, you know, the scientific models, um, really benefited you know tremendously from that data because we could you know, you know are, are these solid rock are they a pile of dust or something in between and, and now we have some actual data uh, to, to inform those models which we can then correlate to other targets and and help uh, uh, future exploration great all right let's go back to that concept of NASA as a catalyst for commercial industry obviously right now we've seen a redirect of where NASA is focusing. We're no longer doing the asteroid redirect mission. We have redirected to the moon through the Artemis program, which for those who may not be aware, is a initiative to send the first woman and the next man to the surface of the moon through NASA. And as a result, it's not just the, the, the program doesn't just center on sending people to the moon. It also centers on science and sending robotic landers to the surface of the moon to learn more about how we can use the resources that are on the moon to further human exploration. So I'd love to talk to you, Alex, and, and jump right in about how is that steering the market for the commercial industry right now? Yeah, it's a great question. And it is a really exciting phase, um, you know, where we really are going back to the moon and we're going back to the moon in order to prepare to go on to Mars. Um, you know, we've actually had consistent congressional direction for about 15 years uh, that a moon to Mars program was what the nation uh, demanded. And, and just, uh, you know, in, uh, in, in early uh, February, um, you know, the Biden administration indicated that it was fully supporting of the Artemis program, uh, which, of course, was uh, encouraging to, to those of us at NASA who've been working on it for quite some time. Um, and the Artemis program includes a lot of different pieces. Um, but you asked specifically about the market, so we'll just focus on a couple of parts of the market. Um, you know, one of the first areas is simply uh, robotic commercial lunar landers through a program that we call uh, CLIPS, the Commercial uh, Lunar Payload Services. And this is done by our science mission director. And it's a very innovative approach to, uh, to planetary science missions. Uh, the approach is basically that we are buying commercial delivery services of science payloads to the lunar surface. And at this point, I think we have now contracted for either four or five uh, specific robotic missions. Uh, each mission is going to carry a suite of science instruments, uh, some funded uh, you know, within NASA centers, some by universities. Uh, and these companies who are doing these missions also have, uh, in some cases, some excess mass to sell for uh, commercial purposes. So this is the beginning of a very dynamic ecosystem. And the next four or five years are going to see a number of these missions attempt to land on the lunar surface. Now, it's important to remember that of the last three missions that tried to land on the lunar surface, two of them failed. And so there's a recognition that this is still a risky uh, uh, business, even for robots. Um, and so uh, this is very much thought of as the shots on goal approach. These are much lower cost missions than traditionally. Um, these tend to fall in the area of about you know, 50 to $100 million a, a piece. Uh, there are still, however, uh, important, I would say NASA directed missions the most important one of those is the Viper mission. And the Viper mission is a robotic rover um, that has been uh, developed over many years uh, at my old NASA center, NASA Ames. Um, and it's there to go and assess the water, to touch the volatiles, the V in Viper stands for volatiles, uh, and water is the principal volatile that we're interested in. And so that's gonna really give us one of our first on the ground maps. And so that's also getting people interested in the market for data, right? Thankfully, because it's a government mission, that data is gonna be provided open to the public. Um, to create as many new opportunities that people can then take the next step on. I'll mention just a, a couple more pieces of the market that are developing because they're really important. Um, the one that's got the most attention is, uh, is of course, the human lander uh, services, the human landing systems contracts. Um, these are still uh, uh, under competition, but the idea is that we are going to be purchasing 
human delivery uh, to the lunar surface as well. And of course, that's incredibly exciting and, and a core to achieving that mission that Artemis has of returning people to the surface of the moon. The last market area I want to talk about, though, is another part of the Artemis mission that's equally important, which is the Gateway. And the Gateway is a uh, habitation vehicle that will be in orbit around the moon. And one of the reasons that it's so important is that it, combined with astronauts on the lunar surface, is going to directly allow us to test the operational uh, paradigms that we're going to use at Mars. Because when we go to Mars for the first time, it's very likely to be a split crew operation. A couple of crew up in orbit, a couple crew down on Earth. Uh, we're going to want to test out that same type of operation at the moon. And the combination of the gateway and uh, the lunar surface activities will allow us to do that. And in terms of markets, well, one of the first contracts that was let for the human spaceflight systems under, uh, under Artemis was the uh, commercial logistics supply for the gateway. So what does that mean well, on some? We have uh, markets for robotic payloads to the surface. We have markets for humans to the surface. We have markets for cargo to a permanent installation around the moon. We are truly beginning a economic system around the moon through a multitude of different uh, vectors and uh, initiatives. All right, I want to back up and I want to talk about that one mo that one concept you talked about, which is water. And throughout the Artem Artemis program, we've heard all about the water ice that is trapped on the moon and how we did not know that it was there before many decades ago. And now that is changing our understanding of the moon. However, we still don't have a very clear picture of the amount of water that is on the moon. So I'd love to know what we do know about the water that is up there and what we need to learn in order to actually use it and know if it's viable. So uh, maybe Daniel, is this something that you wanna jump in on? Oh, sure, I, I, Joe might know a bit more about it. Uh, I've been studying a bit. I know Shackleton Crater, and it, there's a lot of attention at the poles of the moon, in particular the South Pole. And then the question, I believe NASA, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, Alex, they're, they're right now determining where they might set up a base, and there's still some question about that. But I believe yeah. the idea is you want to set up that base on the rim of the crater or near it. You want to have a landing area at least half a mile away or shielded by terrain so you don't bombard whatever habitat you have with uh, materials while uh, resupply ships are landing. And then there's the question of what is in that enormously deep, what is it, 21 kilometers across and deep crater if there is some uh, billion or two billion year old ice, uh, how heavily it, it's differentiated into the terrain or whether it's in big, almost glacial deposits, all of that's something that a, a rover would be able to determine uh, initially. And then it's just that testing and experimenting that gets you to the operational ability to process it. So starting it, I, I think that is so important that uh, you, know, you have a government customer you know, supplying, a, being a lighthouse customer, providing those markets to start that experimental process. Joe, did you want to jump in on that? No, I think that's right. I mean, I think we know uh, it's pretty cold. Uh, it's probably hard to get to. Um, the uh, The reason the first crewed Artemis missions will go to the South Pole is, is because that's where we think uh, there's a higher concentration of water. And I think Daniel was, was really right on all, all the other points. Yeah, I'll, I'll add um, just a couple notes. Um, you know, from an economic perspective, the real question isn't so much just is there water and all the interesting facts about, um, you know, the, where that water came from, which is fascinating, um, but is it economically accessible, right? And one of the challenges with things like Shackleton Crater is that, you know, the, the uh, steep slopes of the crater and the incredible coal that it's found in may make it cost prohibitive for some time as an area for, for finding economically accessible uh, uh, water reserves. There may be other areas that people are looking at that may be not as, as um, large in terms of volume, but much more easy to access, more benign operating environments. So all of these questions are ones that we still have to resolve and work out. Um, and of course, then simple questions of, you know, uh, how mixed is the water with regolith? Are we dealing with uh, relatively, um, you know, un differentiated water or is, you know, are we dealing with one, you know, part water uh, per a hundred of, of regular, right? We're, we're still sorting those things out. And, and that's why missions like Viper are so important. That's why the first missions are going to be uh, doing research in this area as well, where we can. Um, there's still a lot of R&D to be done before we uh, get too serious about operations. 
Um, but you know, uh, a decade here, a decade there, and uh, eventually you're you're getting to the point where you've got a significant amount of experience, and then you can start genuinely thinking about what a more extensive set of operations and infrastructure based on utilizing water will look like. Yeah, I think there's there's many other reasons in addition to water to go explore the moon. There's lots of science to be gained about the history of the moon, the history of Earth, and and as Alex mentioned before, it's it's a training and proving ground for exploration farther out into the solar system. I know that a big selling point of Artemis too is the idea of sustainability and going for the longer term. And the idea of water, if we can access it and it is something that we can incorporate into our mission plans would, would go a long way into meeting that sustainability goal. I guess let's talk about the worst case scenario. Let's say we get to the moon and we realize that this water ice that we, we know is up there is too dispersed throughout the soil and we just can't use it. What does that mean for our hope of sustain sustainability on the moon? Is Does that just go away or are there other ways that we can make a long-term presence viable on the lunar surface? Well, well, water has been detected in varying quantities all over the surface to some degree. And if you've got a very fine regolith, even at equatorial areas, then again, that's a very different proposition. But I don't know, there's something about us as a species uh, adapting and trying to find a way. Um, like Alex says, by getting there, and Joe as well, by getting there, we can start to see what the situation is. And I, I don't know, something about me, I just don't see us saying, well, we can't do it <laughs> and, and walking away. I think there will be so many minds at, uh, cogitating on, on solving this problem. And there's so many different places on the moon that you could get water. I mean, obviously the polar craters, but there's a lot of other materials elsewhere on the moon and water might be a certain percentage of it in addition to iron and thorium and titanium and all sorts of other things. So uh, I don't know, it, it, it will be interesting to see how we solve these problems. And in doing so, of course, cooperating with each other, learning to cooperate with each other and hopefully engaging with science in a very big way again. All of these things are really positive effects, side effects to the process. Yeah, I think yeah. there's, there's a, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Jeff. Where are you going? Okay, so the, um, there's other aspects of sustainability for, for exploration. I think, you know, even if we had to bring fuel and water from Earth and, and stage them at the gateway, I mean, we have, there, there's, there's, that's built into the, to the architecture. There's also, you know, setting up some of the most basic infrastructure on the moon. It takes some initial investment, but once you have it, like power. So if you even have just a small power station, solar powered perhaps, uh, or, or even nuclear powered to charge a rover or to just run some heaters to keep the rover alive through the, the lunar night, you know, that, that increases the, uh, the sustainability of, of the whole, whole operation. It doesn't necessarily re require water, right? There's other ways to do it. Yeah, I, I just wanted to kind of say similarly that, um, you know, finding water and economically accessible water is not required for sustainable presence on the moon. And one of the reasons we know that uh, is that currently we have sustained a continuous presence in low Earth orbit for 20 years. No water there. Uh, no water. Without anything around like that. <laughs> Yeah, and and so that's because we are able to uh, think about sustainability in lots of different ways, right? Sustainability is really about do we have the, the will and the technical capacity and the commitment of funding to maintain a presence there. And so the key for sustainability, in my mind as an economist, you know, water is a nice to have, but it doesn't reduce your costs and thereby increase your sustainability nearly as much as potential reductions in launch costs do. A much more important variable is reductions in launch costs. And an equally important variable to that is the consistent commitment by government, US governments, uh, and, and international governments as well to continue to maintain that presence. The reason we have an international space station continuously inhabited by humans for 20 years is because we've had a continuous commitment by the constituent governments of the International Space Station Partnership to maintain that sustained presence. Getting to the moon and being uh, sustainably on the moon, to my mind will be much more determined by whether we can get that commitment than whether or not we find water. The water and other resources are really interesting because in the long run future, right? In the century long timescales, we know that if we are going to expand into the cosmos, we are eventually going to have to use the resources in order to continue to explore and expand. But in the near term, uh, it's much more just a matter of uh, dollars and cents on an annual basis. 
And I know that this will be airing sometime later than we're actually recording, but just recently, the Biden administration expressed its support for the ongoing Artemis program. So that's that's good news for people that have been working on this, this program. Doesn't sound like there's going to be a massive redirect in the near future. Of course, things could change, but it does seem like that sustained commitment to this program will be will be uh, ongoing for the, the new administration. All right, well, let's talk positively then. So let's say the water is right there on the surface and we can just go and grab it easy peasy. <laughs> what are, what does that open up? We talked about depots. We talked about converting it into fuel. What are some of the other ideas that people have thrown out there that could reduce the cost of making a sustain sustainable lunar presence? Joe, maybe you wanna jump in? Sure, sure. So I think, uh, well, I think, you know, having the water there and the fuel really makes it, uh, is, is really an, a big enabler. But I think then, you know, if we had that, one, you can, you can have fuel and you can also have water to sustain humans. Uh, once you have that, I would start looking into things like building materials and some of the other resources, like what else do we have there? You know, can we use the lunar regolith to build a structure or, or build a, a semi-improved landing pads? Uh, can we um, you know, use the, the energy, you know, from, from the sun and other sources to, to develop power and build some of that infrastructure. That's sort of where I, where I would go next. You know, there's a, a few other really important questions we'd have about long-term habitability in space. Uh, first one is, we don't really know what the minimum dose of gravity is for human beings to thrive. Uh, I always look at this researching spin gravity by obtaining materials like this and bringing them into open space and making truly large structures that we can try to create spin gravity and then run experiments about, well, let's try half gravity for three, three months. Let's try three quarters. Find out what minimum amount we need in order to thrive. It's also getting adequate radiation shielding on these structures. And for that, you need mass. Uh, and then there's always the question of, and this is where I part ways with some people, but I think a lot of people imagine cities of a million people on the moon and, and also Mars. And I really wonder whether early on we want to be going into these gravity wells as opposed to learning how to live and operate in open space uh, at the L points, the Lagrange points, things like that. Uh, that type of uh, learning to operate in deep space like that would solve a lot of problems for us. Whereas if we're really focused on, on building out you know, big communities on either the moon or Mars, you're really solving just those unique problem sets as opposed to you know, building these uh, uh, linchpins in some sort of transportation structure in the solar system by, by building in, in open space. So I'd be curious what, what you gents think about that. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a big open question. I mean, my, my view is that, um, you know, people are going to want to go to lots of different places, right? Um, there's lots of different motivations that people have. Um, and I think that's going to result in a, a multiplicity of, um, of objectives. Uh, some people are just going to like being on rocky surfaces, whether whether it's oh, yeah. you know good for them or not, yeah. Um, uh, but I also think people, of course, are going to be uh, looking to live in um, in zero g places. Uh, certain people find that that's one of the selling points, right, for some of these uh, commercial activities. So maybe not a maybe not a great place to to live, but maybe uh, places that are regularly visited. Um, but of course, you know the, the the spinning stations have a have a deep uh, deep place in all of our visualizations about what our futures look like. Um, you know, from from 2001 to Interstellar, you know, all of them have essentially uh, artificial gravity spinning space stations, one form or another. So uh, clearly, an enduring an enduring idea. Um, I do want to return just briefly to, to Lauren's question there, because um, there's a lot of talk about depots and these things, but. One of the things that we, we kind of talk about from a practical perspective is that it's very likely the first best use of the uh, any sort of water for fuel is going to be for the ascent vehicle. And maybe even before you use it for a human ascent vehicle, you might want to try out using this lunar derived propellant on what we call a robotic hopper, right? And you might have this hopper to go and hop from different parts of the moon and back to, to put down science instruments, do science investigations. And that way you're using this, um, this kind of newly produced uh, you know, propellant on, on a robotic vehicle. Um, because it's important to note that we don't currently uh, produce uh, aerospace grade propellant uh, far away from industrial centers at this moment. In fact, I've often, you know, kind of challenged folks within our uh, NASA Centennial Challenges uh, group to say, hey, you know, this is a really important problem. We should challenge people to see if they could go to a remote mountain glacier that has a mix of gravel and ice and see if they could make aerospace grade propellant out of it. Yeah. And I'm often told, no, we can't do that because that would be too hard and risky. 
<laughs> and that's on Earth. So uh, my guess is, you know, to actually get to aerospace grade propellant to be regularly used in a vehicle, right? Um, that's going to be a long R and D process. And so I suspect that one of the first use cases is going to be in, if not a kind of robotic hopper, um, at least in the ascent vehicles um, that we're talking about that are on the lunar surface. Yeah. We, we you don't want to send engine, it to Mars uh, first. <laughs> you've got to build an engine that can run on dirty water, right? Is another <laughs> way to approach it or both. Right? Yep, exactly. yeah. All right. So we spent a lot of time talking about the technology, which is undoubtedly hard. But let's talk about an equally difficult problem, which is politics. <laughs> and whether or not we're all in agreement about whether or not we should use resources from other bodies outside of our Earth. And one thing that we have that a lot of countries have agreed to is a treaty called the Outer Space Treaty. And that dictates how we can explore space. And one of the things on there, or one of the guidelines within that treaty says that a country cannot lay claim or, or be a sovereign to a celestial body. And there's a lot of debate about what that means for using resources that we use on other planets. So I'd love to know where that debate stands now, especially how the United States interprets that guideline and how we see property rights for uh, resources that companies retrieve from, from other worlds. Yeah, I guess, uh, I guess I'll, I'll start with that. Um, you know, it's a very interesting, uh, very important and uh, increasingly contentious issue. Um, you know, the Outer Space Treaty is very clear, uh, as you said, no sovereign, you know, nations can lay claim to uh, any territory. Um, and also by proxy, no private companies can either because under national law, all private companies in space have to have a sponsoring state who takes on the liability and responsibility for any companies um, that, that it is sponsoring. Um, so so that, that part's pretty clear, but you're right. The question of where exactly the line is between scientific samples and resources and when you're using resources um, is a bit more blurry. It's important to note that, of course, we have returned scientific samples uh, of Earth, and no one has debated uh, who owns those samples, right? In fact, uh, the Russians have sold some of the samples they brought back on the open market. Uh, China has recently brought back samples. The U.S. brought back samples in Apollo. Um, and so there's a couple of different pieces of, of legislation that's worth talking about. Um, the first one after the Outer Space Treaty is, is the Moon Treaty. Now, the Moon Treaty uh, was a treaty that uh, has been, um, there, that there are basically about 18 parties to it. Um, it was initially actually uh, basically promoted and, 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 and to a certain extent even proposed by the United States and actually by the General Council of NASA. Um, and there's a lot of different pieces in the Moon Treaty about the peaceful use of outer space. Uh, but the one that's got attention in, in, in this area um, is the proviso that there should be some sort of regime for managing uh, how the resources of space are, are utilized in a regime to ensure that in some ways that they're managed something like a, a public good for the benefit of, of the planet Earth as a whole. Um, no current major spacefaring state has, uh, has been a party to the treaty. So some people see it as, as a, a treaty that doesn't kind of have full effect at the moment. However, it's worth noting that a lot of uh, emerging space uh, faring nations are parties to the treaty. Australia is. Uh, the Netherlands, Belgium, Austria, Saudi Arabia, Mexico, and Turkey. So there's a lot of economic interest that is actually in there. And so it's interesting to see, you know, if that's going to evolve or not. Um, in the U.S., there have been, you know, developments as well. In 2015, uh, and Joe will know all about this, of course, um, you know, the Space Act was, uh, was passed by Congress and signed in the law by President Obama. That basically, uh, to summarize, uh, basically said, if you mine it, you own it. Um, and by and large, that has been in interpreted within the U.S. as being consistent with the Outer Space Treaty. Um, under the Trump administration, the Trump administration all took, also took a lot of actions to uh, push forward the issue of space resources and space mining claims. Um, and so, you know, now we're in a phase where obviously there's a new administration. We're obviously returning to the moon, so these questions are now more front and center. And so I think we're going to see a, a new phase of discussion and a new phase of dialogue. Um, you know, in the last four years, we've seen a more kind of U.S.-centric and bilateral approach. Uh, there are calls in the international environment for a more 
multilateral approach, given that a lot of different people are going to be going to the lunar surface over the next 10, 15 years. Um, and so I think, you know, it's going to be very interesting to see which way we go. Do we, does the U.S. continue with, with its current approach? Or do we see a resurgence of the Moon Treaty, which, as I mentioned, the U.S. had initially been the principal advocate for it. So uh, a lot to come, and uh, I'm sure it will keep space lawyers employed for, for many decades hence. I would just add that uh, the tiny nation of Luxembourg has also thrown its hat into the ring as a, a sovereign state that would support uh, private enterprise out in space and, and retrieving and, and benefiting from you know, astral celestial resources. So it's interesting to me, I think the laws are gonna be tested uh, very thoroughly in the next few decades, because again, there's so much potential uh, for good, there's potential for abuse, and that really is where the law has come in. And one thing I noticed in my research was Space law is becoming a burgeoning field of, of uh, jurisprudence, and I think that's going to continue to grow as well. I think also what we're learning about space law, too, is that we don't have a lot of precedent for arguments or disagreements. And so it will be interesting if there is some kind of clash on the lunar surface, how we'll deal with that. And I know that the Artemis Accords are kind of trying to prevent something like that from happening. But as you noted, Alex, not everybody's on board, you know, as famously Russia very much against the Artemis Accords and the Artemis program. So it will be interesting to see if there is an opportunity for some kind of dispute, what that will look like um, moving forward. Yeah, yeah I, 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 the, the idea, the idea of, of interference or disputes and how to resolve them is, is just as important as the, the property rights and the ownership question. And the Space Act of 2015 addressed this as well, where at least if there's a dispute between two U.S. companies, it sets sort of the venue for how to resolve those disputes, which is, you know, baby step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Do you guys view maritime yeah. law as a basis for some of this, or is that just completely different from your point of view? It's a good analogy. You know, I, you know, I'm not a space lawyer, but my layman's terms, you know, if, if I'm fishing, you know, I can't own the fish when it's in the water, but once I catch it, it's mine. Like yeah. that's the, that's how I think about it. Yeah. It's a great business yeah. card too, space lawyer. I mean, it's just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, Lauren, I want to return to one, one piece that you, you highlighted there, which is kind of, you know, how do we, how do we ensure that we, we don't end up in, in, in conflict and, and minimize um, you know, the, the, the potential for conflict? Because you know, stepping back at a macro level, you know, um, you know, uh, to kind of you know, paraphrase H.G. Uh, Wells uh, a little bit, you know, the choice be, be, before us is, you know, are we gonna have a Star Trek future or a Dune future? You know, are we going to uh, be exploring and learning from the cosmos, uh, you know, in partnership and cooperation uh, and in peace? Um, or are we going to be seeing clashes between the great houses uh, for ownership of the galaxy? And I think the reason that there's a lot of discussion debate around this is, is because there are a lot of value statements uh, kind of playing out in these discussions. In fact, it's mostly that given the fact that currently there are no profitable space resources. Um, and so I think there's a lot of political discussions around this. And, and I think we're seeing a return to um, the kind of politics, kind of geopolitics around space that we had in the 60s and 70s, because we're returning to that level of engagement by uh, world leaders in this issue. Um, you know, through the last four years in the Artemis program, uh, there's been very heavy engagement at the top levels of government in our partner countries uh, for the Artemis program. Uh, in Canada, personally announced by the prime minister. Uh, in Japan, same thing. And the European Space Agency um, had to get all of its member states, of which there are uh, more than I can remember, but well over a dozen, um, get all of their countries to buy in on this idea that they are investing their taxpayers' dollars and returning to the moon. To do that required really serious high-level politics. And I'll note, you mentioned our Russian partners, who of course are absolutely critical to our uh, ongoing activity in the International Space Station. Although they have made um, you know, some comments about the Artemis Accords, it's important to note that they're actually still uh, engaging with us in conversations about how to be part of Artemis. And so even at that level, um, there is a distinction between the clear desire of the world to want to work together to return to the moon and then debates about what does it mean you know, to go to the moon uh, under what types of arrangements, under what types of uh, value systems. And we saw a very similar uh, debate, frankly, around the original outer space treaty. 
Um, and so we can feel that there's a lot building in this area. And I think, I think we're really just at the beginning of it. You know, this is really one of the underappreciated benefits of space and space exploration is it, you know, it creates an opportunity for diplomacy and for international cooperation uh, that really has, has uh, lasted beyond uh, lots of other venues, right? So, so the U.S. and Russian cooperation on the ISS has, you know, standed uh, uh, firm o- over many, many years and is one of, one of the, uh, you know, strongest areas of, of the, that those, you know, our two countries work together on. And it's a great time to have a reason for cooperation, too. Again, to bring up climate change, you know, we're, we're possibly entering into a period of increased, uh, let's say, uncontrolled migration, uh, you know, droughts, uh, horrific storms. All of these things could, could really disrupt economies. And already there's 3.4 billion people who exist at a subsistence level. The idea of being able to vastly increase energy and resources to try to focus on some of these problems for the world there's a lot to be gained by cooperating and there's a great deal to lose by not cooperating. So all of this is, uh, this idea of building cooperation is a really good point. All right, so we are, we don't have much time left. So I wanna ask one final question of all of you. And that is, what are you looking most forward to in the space resources space, if you will, over the next decade? And what do you think is going to be the next big thing that leaps us forward in this area? So Joe, let's start with you. Yeah, so you know, we talked, uh, I think, a lot about water and all the resources. You know, one opportunity that really gets me excited is, you know, with Artemis and with lunar exploration, um, there is this idea of infrastructure and other services that support it. So if you look at the biggest market uh, for space for Earth is communications. So I think the opportunity to provide communications and navigation services on and around the moon to support exploration is, is probably one of the biggest commercial opportunities that we'll see coming up here in the near term. Alex, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I think I'll, I'll, I'll say that I'm most looking forward to seeing the results of the first robotic missions that really get to touch the water, poke the water, figure out what state it's in. Once we have you know, a couple of uh, examples of that from a couple different locations on the lunar surface, I think we're going to be in a whole different ball game in terms of assessing the economic potential that we're dealing with. And I'm most excited, I think, to see the first successful mining and processing operation, that idea of of once you've located those resources to be able to economically, or at least reasonably process it and turn it into something useful. The moment I think that's been done, it is is proven that it's possible. And, And from that, everything else follows. All righty. Well, gentlemen, this has been a great discussion. I actually had a million more questions, but we only have so much time. And I feel like we could have talked about this for hours and hours, which just goes to show that there, this industry has a lot of potential, right? And there's a lot to talk about and a lot to be excited for and, and wait for on the horizon. So I really appreciate you all sharing your insights with me today. And thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to what the industry has to offer. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks. Great. Thanks a lot, everyone.